Hello, Cardinals, and today we will continue our reading of Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Cray, Chapter 9, Hike. After an hour of walking, Snowman comes out from the former park. He picks his way farther inland, heading along the trashed Cleveland boulevards and avenues and roads and streets. Wrecked solar cars are plentiful, some piled up in multi-vehicle crashes, some burnt out, some standing intact as if temporarily parked. There are trucks and vans, fuel cell models, and also the old gas, old, gas or diesel kinds, and ATVs. A few bicycles, a few motorcycles, not a bad choice considering the traffic jams. I'm sorry, considering the traffic mayhem that must have lasted for days. On a two-wheeled item, you'd have been able to weave in and out among the larger vehicles until someone shot you or ran into you or you fell off. There was a one, this was once a semi-residential sector. Shops on the ground floor gutted now, small dim apartments above. Most of the signs are still in place despite the bullet holes in them. People had hoarded the lead bullets from the time before spray guns, despite the ban on the plebes having any kind of gun at all. Snowman's been unable to find any bullets, not that he'd had a rusty old firearm that would take them. The buildings that didn't burn or explode are still standing, though the botany is thrusting itself through every crack. Given time, it will fissure the asphalt, topple the walls, push aside the roof, some kind of vine is growing everywhere, draping the window sills, climbing in through the broken windows, up the bars and grill work. Soon this district will be a thick tangle of vegetation. If he'd postponed the trip much longer, the way back would have become impassable. It won't be long before all visible traces of human habitation will be gone. But suppose, just suppose, thinks Snowman, that he's not the last of his kind. Suppose there are others. He wills them into being these possible remnants who might have survived the isolated pockets, cut off by the shutdown of the communication networks, keeping themselves alive somehow. Monks in desert hideaways far from contagion, mountain goat herders who'd never mixed with the valley people, lost tribes in the jungle, survivalists who'd tuned in early, shot all comers, sealed themselves into the underground bunkers, hillbillies, recluses, wandering lunatics swathed in protective hallucinations, bands of nomads following their ancient ways. How did this happen, their descendants will ask, stumbling upon the evidence, the ruins, the ruinous evidence. Who made these things? Who lived in them? Who destroyed them? The Taj Mahal, the Louvre, the pyramids, the Empire State Building, stuff you've seen on TV and old books on postcards on blood and roses. Imagine coming upon them, 3D, life-size, with no preparation. You'd be freaked. You'd run away, and after that, you'd need an explanation. At first, they'll say giants are gods, but sooner or later, they'll want to know the truth. Like him, they'll have the curious monkey brain. Perhaps they'll say these things are not real, they're phantasmagoria. They were made by dreams, and now that no one is dreaming them any longer, they're crumbling away. Let's suppose for the sake of argument, said Craig one evening, that civilization as we know it gets destroyed. Want some popcorn? Is that real butter, said Jimmy? Nothing but the best at Watson Crick, said Craig. Once it's flattened, it could never be rebuilt. Because why? Got any salt? Because all the available surface metals have already been mined, said Craig, without which no Iron Age, no Bronze Age, no Age of Steel and all the rest of it. There's metals further down, but the advanced technology we need for extracting those would have been obliterated. It could be put back together, said Jimmy, chewing. It was so long since he'd tasted popcorn this good. They'd still have the instructions. Actually not, said Craig. It's not like the wheel. It's too complex now. Suppose the instructions survive. Suppose there were any people left with the knowledge to read them. Those people would be few and far between, and they wouldn't have the tools. Remember, no electricity. And then once those people died, that would be it. They'd have no apprentices. They'd have no successors. What a beer. Is it cold? All it takes, said Craig, is the elimination of one generation. One generation of anything. Beetles, trees, microbes, scientists, speakers of French, whatever. Break the link in time between one generation and the next, and it's game over forever. Speaking of games, said Jimmy, it's your move. The walking has become an obstacle course for Snowman. In several places, he's needed to make detours. Now he's in a narrow side street, choked with vines. They've festooned themselves across the street from roof to roof. 
through the clefts and the overhead greenery, he can see a handful of vultures circling idly in the uh, sky. He can, they can see him too. They have eyesight, like ten magnifying glasses. Those things can count the change in your pocket. He knows a thing or two about vultures. Not yet, he calls up to them. But why disappoint them? If he were to stumble and fall, cut himself open, knock himself out, then be set upon by wolves or pigoons, what difference would it make to anyone but himself? The Crakers are doing fine. They don't need him anymore. For a while, they'll wonder where he's gone, but he's already provided an answer to that. He's gone to be with Crake. He'll become a secondary player in their mythology, such as it is, a sort of backup uh, demiurge. He'll be falsely remembered. He won't be mourned. The sun is climbing higher, intensifying its rays. He feels lightheaded. A thick tendril slithers away, flickering its tongue as, it, as his foot comes down beside it. He needs to pay more attention. Are any of the snakes venomous? Did that long tail he almost stepped on have a small furry body at the front? He didn't see it clearly. He certainly hopes not. The claim was that all the snaps had been destroyed, but it would take only one pair of them. One pair, the Adam and Eve of snaps and some weirdo with a grudge, bidding them go forth and multiply, relishing the idea of those things twirling up the drain pipes, rats with long green scaly tails and rattlesnake fangs. He decides not to think about it. Instead, he begins to hum to cheer himself up. What's the song, Winter Wonderland? They used to recycle that in the malls every Christmas, long after the last time it snowed. Some tune about playing pranks on a snowman before it got mushed. Maybe he's not the abominable snowman after all. Maybe he's the other kind of snowman, the grinning dope set up as a joke and pushed down as entertainment, his pebble smile and carrot nose an invitation to mockery and abuse. Maybe that's the real him, the last homo sapiens, the white illusion of a man, here today, gone tomorrow, so easily shoved over, left to melt in the sun, getting thinner and thinner until he liquefies and trickles away altogether, as snowman is doing now. He pauses and wipes the sweat off his face, drinks half a bottle of his water. He hopes that there will be more somewhere soon. Up, a ha up ahead, the houses thin out and vanish. There's an interval of parking lots and warehouses and then barbed wire strung between cement po posts. An elaborate gate off its hinges, end of urban sprawl and plebe city limits, beginning of compound turfdom. Here's the last station of the sealed tunnel bullet train with its plastic jungle gym colors. No risk here, the colors are saying, just kitty fun. But this is the dangerous part. Up to here, he's always had something he could climb or scramble up or dodge or around in case of a flank attack, but now comes an open space with no shelter and few verticals. He pulls the sheet up over his baseball cap to protect himself from the sun's glare, shrouding himself like an Arab and plods on, picking up the pace as much as he can. He knows he'll burn some even through the sheet if he stays out here long enough. His best hope is speed. He'll need to get to shelter before noon when the asphalt will be too hot to walk on. Now he's reached the compound. He passes the turn off to Cryo, a genius, one of the smaller outfits. He'd like to have been a fly on the wall when the lights went out and 2,000 frozen millionaires' heads awaiting resurrection began to melt in the dark. Next comes Genie Gnomes with the elfin ma mascot popping its pointy-eared head in and out of a test tube. The neon was on, he noted. The solar hookup must still be functioning, though not perfectly. Those signs were supposed to go on only at night. And finally, rejuvenescence, where he'd made so many mistakes, misunderstood so much, gone on his last joyride. Bigger than organ ink farms, bigger than health wise, they were the biggest of them all. He passes the first barricade with its cracked out scopers and busted searchlights, and then the checkpoint booth. A guard is lying half in, half out. So man isn't too surprised by the absence of a head. In times of crisis, emotions run high. He checks to see if the gun still has, if the guy still has a spray gun, but no dice. Next comes a tract kept free of buildings, no man's land, Craig used to call it. No trees here. They'd been mowed down. They'd mowed down anything you could hide behind. Divided the territory into squares with lines of heat and motion center, sensors. The eerie chessboard effect is already gone. Weeds are poking up like whiskers all over the flat surface. Snowman takes a few minutes to scan the field, but apart from a cluster of dark birds squabbling over some object on the ground, nothing's moving. 
and then he goes forward. <clears throat> now he's on the approach proper. Along the road is a trail of objects people must have dropped in flight, like a treasure hunt in reverse. A suitcase, a knapsack, pilling out, spilling out clothes and trinkets, an overnight bag broken open. Beside it, a forlorn pink toothbrush, a bracelet, a woman's hair ornament in the shape of a butterfly, a notebook, its pages soaked, the handwriting illegible. The fugitives must have had hope to begin with. They must have thought they'd have a use for these things later. Then they'd change their minds and let go. Rejuvenescence. He's out of breath and sweating too much by the time he reaches the rejuvenescence compound. A curtain wall, still 12 feet high, but no longer electrified, its iron spikes rusting. He goes through the outer gate, which looks as if someone blew it apart, pausing in its shadow to eat the chocolate energy bar and drink the rest of his water. Then he continues on across the moat, past the sentry boxes where the Corsicor armed guards once stood in glassed-in cubicles where they'd monitored the surveillance equipment, then past the rampart watchtower with the steel door standing forever open now, where he'd once have been ordered to present his thumbprint in the iris of his eye. Beyond is the vista he remembers so well. The residence is laid out like a garden suburb and with large houses and fake Georgian and uh, fake Tudor and fake French Provincial. The meandering streets leading to the employees' golf course and their restaurants and nightclubs and medical clinics and shopping malls and indoor tennis courts and their hospitals. To the right are the off-bound, hot bioform isolation facilities, bright orange with the black cube-shaped, cube shatterproof glass fortresses that were the business end of things. In the distance is his destination, the Central Park with the top of Craig's charmed dome visible up the, above the trees, round and white and glaring, like a bubble of ice, looking at it, he shivers. But no point, time for pointless repining. He hikes rapidly along the main street, stepping around the huddle of cloth and gnawed human carcasses. Not much left except the bones. The scavengers have done their work. At the time he walked out here, this place looked like a riot scene and stank like an abattoir, but now all is quiet and the stench is mostly gone. The pigoons have rooted up the lawns. Their hoof marks are everywhere, though luckily not too fresh. His first object is food. It would make sense to go all the way along the road to where the malls are. More chance of a square meal there, but he's too hungry for that. Also, he needs to get out of the sun right now. So he takes the second left into one of the residential sections. Already the weeds are thick along the curb. The street is circular, the island in the middle, a clutch of shrubs, unpruned and scraggly. Flares with red and purple flowers, some exotic splice. In a few years, they'll be overwhelmed. Or else they'll spread, make inroads, choke out the native plants. Who can tell which? The whole world is now one vast, uncontrolled experiment. The way it always was, Craig would have said, and the doctrine of unintended consequences is in full state. The house he chooses is a medium size, the Queen Anne. The front door is locked, but a diamond-paned window has been smashed. Some doomed looter must have been there before him. Snowman wonders what the poor guy was looking for. Food, useless money, or just a place to sleep. Whatever it was, it wouldn't have done him much good. Uh, he drinks a few handfuls of water from a stone bird bath ornamented with wit wit witless looking frogs and still mostly full of yesterday's downpour and not too muddied with bird droppings. What disease do the birds carry and is it in their shit? He'll have to chance it. After splashing his face and neck, he refills his bottle. Then he studies the house for sign, for movement. He can't rid himself of the notion that someone, someone like him, is lying in wait around some corner, behind some half-open door. He takes off his sunglasses and knots them into his sheet, and then he climbs in through the broken window, one leg and then the other, throwing his stick in first. Now he's in the dimness. The hair on his arms prickles, claustrophobia and bad energy are all pressing down on him. The air is thick as if panic has condensed in here and hasn't yet had time to dissipate. It smells like a thousand bad dreams. Hello, he calls. Anybody home? He can't help it. Any house speaks to him of potential inhabitants. He feels like turning back. Nausea simmers in his throat. But he holds the corner of his rancid sheet over his nose. At least it's his own smell. And makes his way across the moldering uh, broadloom, past the dim shapes of the plump reproduction furniture. There's a squeaking, a scurrying, the rats have taken over. He picks his steps with care. 
He knows what he looks like to rats carrying in the hoof. They sound like real rats, though, not snaps. Snaps don't squeak, they hiss. Did squeak, did hiss, he corrects himself. They were liquidated, they're extinct. He must insist on that. First things first, he locates the liquor cabinet in the dining room and goes through it quickly. A half bottle of bourbon, nothing else, only a bunch of empties, no cigarettes. It must have been a non-smoking household or else the looter before him pinched them. Fuck you, he says to the fumed oak sideboard. Then he tiptoes up the carpeted stairs to the second floor. Why so quietly as if he's a real burglar? He can't help it. Surely there are people here asleep. Surely they'll hear him and wake up, but he knows that's foolish. There's a man in the bathroom sprawled on the earth-toned tile, earth tiles wearing what's left of them. A pair of blue and maroon striped pajamas. Strange, thinks Snowman. How in an emergency a lot of people would head for the bathroom. Bathrooms were the closest things to sanctuary in these, in these houses. Places where you could be alone to meditate, meditate, also to puke, to bleed from the eyes, to shit your guts out, to grope desperately in the medicine cabinet for some pill that would save you. It's a nice bathroom. A jacuzzi, ceramic Mexican mermaids on the walls, their heads crowned with flowers, their blonde hair waving down, their painted nipples bright pink on breasts that are small but rounded. He wouldn't mind a shower. This place probably has a gravity flow rainwater backup tank, but there's some form of hardened gunk in the tub. He takes a bar of soap for later and checks the cabinet for sunblock without success. A Bliss Plus container, half full. A bottle of aspirin, which he snacks. He thinks about adding a toothbrush, but he has an aversion to sticking a dead person's toothbrush into his mouth, so he takes only the toothpaste. For a wider smile, he reads, fine with him. He needs a wider smile, though he can't at the moment think what for. The mirror on the front of the cabinet has been smashed, some last act of ineffectual rage or cosmic protest. Why this? Why me? He can understand that. He'd have done the same. Broken something, turned his last glimpse of himself into fragments. Most of the glass is in the sink, but he's careful where he places his feet, like a horse. His life now depends on them. If he can't walk, he's rat food. He continues along the hall. The lady of the house is in the bedroom, tucked under the king-sized pink and gold duvet. One arm and shoulder blade outside the covers, bones and tendons, and a leopard uh, skin print nighty. Her face is turned away from him, which is just as well, but her hair is intact. All of it a piece, as if it's a wig. Dark roots, frosted with with a sort of pixie look. On the right, um, on the right woman, that could be attractive. At one time in his life, he used to go through other people's bureau drawers, given half the chance. But in this room, he doesn't want to. Anyway, it would be the same sort of thing: underwear, sex aids, costume jewelry, mixed in with pencil stubs, spare change, and safety pins, and a diary if he got lucky. When he was still in high school, he liked reading girls' diaries with their capital letters and multiple exclamation marks and extreme phrasing, love, 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 hate, 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 and their colored underlining like the crank letters he used to get later at work. He'd wait till the girl was in the shower, do a lightning swift rummage, of course it was his own name he'd be searching for, though he hadn't always liked what he'd found. Once he'd read, Jimmy, you nosy brat, I know you're reading this, I hate it just because I fucked I, I'm sorry, I hate it. Just because I fucked you doesn't mean I like you, so stay out. Two red lines under hate, three under stay out. Her name had been Brenda, cute, a gum chewer, sat in front of him in life skills class. She'd had a solar battery robo-dog on her dresser that barked, fetched a plastic bone, and lifted its leg to pee yellow water. It always struck him how the toughest and most bitchy girls had the schmaltziest, squishiest doodads in their bedroom. The vanity table holds the standard collection of firming creams, hormone treatments, ampules and injections, cosmetics, colognes. In the half-light that comes through the slatted blind, these things gleam darkly, like a still life muted with varnish. He sprays himself with the stuff in one of the bottles, a musky scent he hopes might cut the other smells in here. Crack cocaine, its label says, in raised gold lettering. He thinks briefly about drinking it, but remembers that he has the bourbon. Then he bends down to take stock of himself in the oval mirror. He can't re resist mirrors in the places he breaks into. He sneaks a peek at himself every chance he has. Increasingly, it's a shock. 
A stranger stares back at him, bleary-eyed, hollow-cheeked, pocked with bug bite scabs. He looks 20 year old, years older than he is. He winks, grins at himself, sticks out his tongue. The effect is truly sinister. Behind him in the glass, the husk of the woman in the bed seems almost like a real woman, as if at any moment she might turn towards him, open her arms, whisper to him to come and get her, her in her pixie hair. Oryx had a, a wig like that. She liked to dress up, change her appearance, pretend to be different women. She'd strut around the room, do a little strip, wiggle and pose. She said men like variety. Who told you that, Jimmy asked. Oh, someone, and then she laughed. That was right before he scooped her up and her wig fell off. Jimmy! But he can't afford to think about Oryx right now. He finds himself standing in the middle of the room, hands dangling, mouth open. I have been unintelligent, he says out loud. Next door, there's a children's room with a computer in gay red plastic, a shelf of teddy bears, a wallpaper freeze of giraffes, and a stash of CDs containing, judging from the pictures on them, some extremely violent computer games, but there's no child and no child's body. Maybe it died and was cremated in those first few days when cremations were still taking place, or maybe it was frightened when its parents keeled over and began gurgling blood and it ran away somewhere else. Maybe it was one of the cloth and bone bundles he passed on the streets outside. Some of them were quite small. He locates the linen closet in the hall and exchanges his filthy sheet for a fresh one, this time not plain, but patterned with scrolls and flowers. This will make an impression among the Crakers. Look, they'll say, Snowman is growing leaves. They wouldn't put it past him. There's a whole stack of clean sheets in the closet, nicely folded, but he only takes the one. He doesn't want to weigh himself down with stuff he doesn't really need. If he has to, he can always come back for more. He hears his mother's voice telling him to put the discarded sheet in the laundry hamper. Old neurological pathways die hard, but he drops it on the floor instead and goes back downstairs to the kitchen. He hopes he'll find some canned food there, soy stew or beans and fake wieners, anything with protein in it. Even some vegetables would be nice, airsats or not, he'll take anything. But whoever smashed the window also cleaned out the cupboard. There's a handful of dry cereal in a plastic snap top container, so he eats that. It's unadulterated junk gene cardboard, and he has to chew a lot and drink some water to get it down. He finds three packets of cashew nuts, snack packs from the bullet chain train, and gobbles one of them immediately. It isn't too stale. There's also a tin of soy boy sardines. Otherwise, there's only a half-empty bottle of ketchup, dark brown and fermenting. He knows better than to open the refrigerator. Some of the smell in the kitchen is coming from there. In one of the drawers under the counter, there's a flashlight that works. He takes that and a couple of candle ends and some matches. He finds a plastic garbage bag right where it should be and puts everything into it, including the sardines and the other two packs of cashews with the bourbon and the soap and the aspirin. There are some knives, but not very sharp. He chooses two and a small cooking pot. That will come in handy if he can find something to cook. Down the hallway, tucked in between the kitchen and the utility room, there's a small home office. A desk with a dead computer, a fax, a printer, also a container with plastic pens, a shelf with reference books, a dictionary, a thesaurus, a Bartlett, the Norton Anthology of Modern Poetry. The striped pajamas guy upstairs must have been a word person then. A rejuvenescent speechwriter, an ideological plumber, a spin doctor, a hair splitter for hire. Poor bugger, thinks Snowman. Beside a vase of withered flowers and a framed father and son snapshot, the child was a boy then, seven or eight. There's a telephone scratch pad. Scrawled across the top page are the words get lawn mode, and then in small, smaller, fainter letters, call clinic. The ballpoint pen is still on the paper as if dropped from a slackening hand. It must have come suddenly right then, the sickness and the realization of both. Snowman can picture the guy figuring it out as he looked down at his own moving hand. He must have been an early case or he wouldn't still have been worrying about his lawn. The back of his neck prickles again. Why does he have the feeling that it's his own house he's broken into? His own house from 25 years ago, himself the missing child. Twister. Snowman makes his way through the curtains any light of the living room to the front of the house. 
plotting his future course. He'll have to try for a house richer in canned goods or even a mall. He could camp out there overnight up on one of the top shelving racks. That way he could take his time, bag only the best. Who knows? There may still be some chocolate bars. Then, when he knows he's covered the nutrition angle, he can head for the bubble dome, kill for the arsenal. Once he's got a functional spray gun in his hands, he'll, again, he'll feel a lot safer. He throws a stick out through the broken window, and then he climbs out himself, taking care not to rip his new flowered sheet or cut himself or tear his plastic bag on the jagged glass. Directly across from him on the overgrown lawn, cutting off access to the street, there's a quintuplet of pigoons rooting around in a small heap of trash he hopes is only clothing. A boar, two sows, they're young. When they hear him, they stop feeding and lift their heads. They see him all right. He raises his stick, shakes it at them. Usually they bolt if he does that. Pagoons have long memories and sticks look like electroprods. But this time, they stand their ground. They're sniffing in his direction. As if puzzled, maybe they smell the perfume he, pray he sprayed on himself. The stuff could have analog mammalian sex pheromones in it, which would be just his luck. Trampled to death by lustful pagoons. What a moronic finish. What can he do if they charge? Only one option, scramble back through the window. Does he have time for that? Despite those stubby legs carrying their enormous bulk, the damn things can run very fast. The kitchen knives are in his garbage bag. In any case, they're too short and flimsy to do much damage to a full-sized pagoon. It would be like trying to stick a paring knife into a truck tire. The boar lowers its head, hunching its massive neck and shoulders and swaying uneasily back and forth, making up its mind. But the others have already been, begun moving away, so the boar thinks better of it and follows them, making its contempt and defiance, um, marking its contempt and defiance by dropping a pile of dung as it goes. Snowman stands still until they're all out of sight and then proceeds with caution, looking frequently behind him. There are too many pigoon tracks around here. These beasts are clever enough to fake a retreat and then lurk around the next corner. They'd bowl him over, trample him, and then rip him open, munch up the organs first. He knows their taste. A brainy and omnivorous animal, the pigoon. Some of them uh, may even have human neocortex tissue growing in their crafty, wicked heads. Yes, there they are up ahead. They're coming out from behind a bush, all five of them. No, all seven. They're starting in his direction. It would be a mistake to turn his back or to run. He raises the stick and walks sideways back in the direction from which he's come. If necessary, he can take refuge inside the checkpoint gatehouse and stay there till they go away. Then he'll have to find a roundabout route to the, the bubble dome, keeping to the side streets where evasion is, is possible. But in the time it takes him to cover the distance, slip-stepping as if some grotesque dance with all the pagoons still staring, Dark clouds have come boiling up from the south, blotting up the sun. This isn't the usual afternoon storm. It's too early, and the sky is an, an ominous greenish-yellow tinge. It's a twister, a big one. The pagoons have vanished now, gone to seek shelter. He stands outside the checkpoint cubicle, watching the storm roll, roll forward. It's a grand spectacle. He once saw an amateur documentary maker with a camcorder stuck right up into one of those. He wonders how Crake's children are getting along back at the shore. Too bad for Crake if the living results of all the theories are whirled away into the sky or swept out to sea on a big wave. But that won't happen. In case of high seas, the breakwaters formed by fallen rubble will protect them. As for the Twister, they've weathered one of those before. They'll retreat into the central cavern of the jumble of concrete blocks they call their Thunder Home and wait it out. The advanced winds hit, stirring up debris on the open field, lightning zips it between the clouds. He can see the thin dark cones zigzagging downwards, then dis darkness descends. Luckily, the checkpoint is built into the security building beside it, and those things are like bunkers, thick and solid. He ducks inside as the first rain strikes. There's a shrieking of wind, a crashing of thunder, a vibrating sound as everything still nailed down, hums like a gear in a giant engine. A large object hits the outer wall. He moves inward through one doorway and then another, scrambling in his garbage bag for the flashlight. He's got it out and is fumbling with it when there's another gigantic crash and the overhead lights blink on. Some previously side fried solar circuit must have been refried. He almost wishes the lights hadn't gone on. 
there's a couple of bios who soften the corner with whatever's left inside of them in a bad state of repair. Filing cabinets pulled open, paper scattered everywhere. Look as, looks as if the guards were overwhelmed. Maybe they were trying to stop people from getting out through the gate. There was an attempt to enforce uh, quarantine, as he recalls, but the antisocial elements, which would have included just about everyone by then, must have broken in and trashed the secret files. How optimistic of them to have believed that any of the paperwork and storage disks might still have been the use, of use to anyone. He forces himself to go over the suits. He prods them with his stick, turns them over. Not as bad as he thought, not too smelly. Only a few beetles, anything soft is mostly gone, but he can't find any weapons. The antisocials must have made off with those as he would have done, as he did do. He leaves the inmost room, goes back to the receptionist area, the part with the counter and desk. All at once, he's very tired. He sits down in the ergonomic chair. It's been a long time since he sat in a chair and he feels strange. He decides to set out his matches and candle ends in case the lights go out again. While he's at it, he has a drink of bird bath water and the second package of cashews. From outside comes the howling of wind, an unearthly noise like a huge animal unchained and raging. Gusts are coming in. Past the doors he's closed, stirring up the dust. Everything rattles. His hands are shaking. This is getting to him more than he's allowed himself to admit. What if there are rats in here? There must be rats. What if it starts to flood? They'll run up his legs. <laughs> he pulls his legs up onto the chair, folds them over one of the ergonomic arms, and tucks the floral sheet around them. No hope of hearing any telltale squeaking. The racket of the storm is too loud. A great man must rise to the challenge is in life, says a voice. Who is it this time? A motivational lecturer from Rejuve TV, some fatuitous drone in a suit, a gabbler for hire. This is surely the lesson taught to us by history. The higher the hurdle, the greater the jump. Having to face a crisis causes you to grow as a person. I haven't grown as a person, you cretin, showman, snowman shouts. Look at me, I've shrunk. My brain is the size of a grape. But he doesn't know which it is, bigger or smaller, because there's nobody to measure himself by. He's lost in a fog, no benchmarks. The lights go out, and now he's alone in the dark. So what, he tells himself, you were alone in the light, no big difference, but there is. He's ready, though. He gets a grip. He starts, stands the flashlight on end, strikes a match in its feeble beam, manages to light a candle. It wavers in the drafty air, but it burns, casting a small glowing circle of light, or a soft yellow on the desk, turning the room around him into an ancient cave, dark but protective. He rummages in the plastic bag, finds the third pack, the pack of cashews rips it open and eats the contents. He takes out the bottle of bourbon, thinks about it, and then unscrews the top and drinks. Gluck, 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 goes the cartoon writing over his head. Fire water. Oh, sweetie, a woman's voice says from the corner of the room. You're doing very well. No, I'm not, he says. A puff of air, woof, hits his ears, blows out the candle. He can't be bothered relighting it because the bourbon's taking over. He'd rather stay in the dark. He can sense Oryx drifting towards him on her soft, feathery wings. Any moment now, she'll be with him. He sits crouched in the chair with his head down on the desk and his eyes closed in a state of misery and peace.